Lifting up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, the United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. The popular Chinese dish, chop suey, was actually invented in San Francisco, California. It did not originate in China. Chinese people to this day largely wouldn't know what it is. It's served in Chinese restaurants around the world, but not much in China. Yet we call it Chinese food. By calling something Chinese does not make it Chinese. In fact, it's American. Calling something Palestinian does not make it ethnically Palestinian. Let's understand what Palestine and Palestinian really is. It's an anthropological term, it's a geographical term, and it's a theological term. Let's begin as an anthropological term. What is an ethnic Palestinian? Palestine is simply the Latinization of Philistine by the Romans in the second century the Philistinim, Palestinian. The Romans, after the Second Jewish Revolt, renamed the area between the Jordan and the Mediterranean, Palestine, after the ancient Philistines, who by that time had long disappeared. The Philistines were not an Arab people. They were an Indo-European people from Crete. We know this by the archaeological digs in Heraklion and Crete comparing them with archaeological finds in the Gaza Strip. Their god was the fish god Dagon. They were a Greek people. They worshipped Greek idols. They had a Greek culture. They were not in any sense Arab. These were the original Palestinians, the true Palestinians. An ethnic Palestinian has not existed in 2000 500 years at least. There has not been a Palestinian on the face of the earth in any ethnic sense. Then we have it as a theological term. There have been books written by scholars, scholars with whom I myself do not even agree theologically, such as E.P. Sanders, who authored books such as Christ and Palestinian Judaism or Paul and Palestinian Judaism. Jewish and Christian theology came from that region between the Jordan and the Mediterranean. That is true. That is the theological origins historically of both Judaism and Christianity. As a theological term, we have Palestinian theology, which is Judeo-Christian. Islamic theology came from Arabia in its origin. Its ontogeny was Arabian, and it developed through the Middle Ages in Egypt. Islam is not theologically a Palestinian religion the way Judaism and Christianity are. It is a simple fact. Any Islamic scholar knows that. Then we have Palestine as a geographical description. Again, largely the area between the Jordan Basin and the Mediterranean. Prior to the establishment of the Jewish state, the reestablishment of the Jewish state by the United Nations in 1948, the region was called Palestine and had been for some time. But only as a geographical term. A Palestinian was not an Arab in any sense. There were 30,000 plus Jewish soldiers who fought in the British army in the Royal Palestine Legion. That was on their patch. Every one of them was a Jew. The original name of the Jerusalem Post, Israel's English language newspaper, was the Palestine Post. The original name of the Israeli Philharmonic Orchestra was the Palestine Symphony. A Palestinian was someone of any ethnic or religious background who lived there. Mainly Jews, Christians, and Muslims. They were all Palestinians. However, 
something has since happened. We have people claiming a Palestinian identity that was in fact not their own claim, but was imposed on them for political considerations by their leaders in the 1960s and 70s. They are not ethnic Palestinians. They are not European, they are Arab. Their ancestors originated in Arabia, and most of the people today calling themselves or are being called Palestinian are in fact the descendants of immigrants who came to the land between the Jordan and the Mediterranean, often illegally during the British mandate and during the Jewish Aliyah for a higher standard of living under the British and Jews than was available in the surrounding Arab world. They came from Tunisia, they came from Egypt, they came from Arabia. Yasser Arafat was born in Egypt, educated in Egypt and served in the Egyptian army. There was land owned by absentee Arab landlords but there was no state or people called Palestinian. A Palestinian was anybody who lived in the geographical region, be they Jew, Arab, Christian, otherwise. Yet something happens. In 1970s, people in the West Bank of the Jordan went to sleep. They went to sleep that night being Jordanians. Who said they were Jordanians? In 1970 and in 1968, Yasser Arafat said, Palestine is Jordan. Only when he attempted to take over Jordan from the Hashemite Bedouin kingdom of King Hussein in Black September of 1970, the British armed and equipped Jordanian legion systematically massacred between 15 and 18,000 of Yasser Arafat's so-called Palestinian followers in 12 days in Black September. Tens of thousands more were driven into refugee camps in Lebanon by the Jordanians, not by the Israelis. They didn't come from the West Bank, they came from Jordan. Gary Burge doesn't tell you that. Stephen Sizer doesn't tell you that. Colin Chapman doesn't tell you that. Philip Church doesn't tell you that. Historical documents tell you that. Not only did Yasser Arafat say that Jordan was Palestine, but so did His Majesty King Hussein of Jordan, who I met when I was 15 years old in Virginia and America. Nice man. He said Jordan is Palestine. So did King Faisal of Iraq, who was deposed by Saddam Hussein's Ba'ath Party say Israel was for the Jews. King Musharraf, who was deposed by the House of Saud in the Jihad in Saudi Arabia, establishing Saudi Arabia, said Israel is for the Jews. Many Arabs and many Bedouins supported the Jewish Aliyah. There was no claim of Palestinian identity, ethnicity, anthropological identity, statehood. There was no such thing. Jordan was Palestine. Arafat said so. Palestine was Jordan. The Jordanian government said so. King Hussein said so. They said so themselves. But they went to bed in 1970, and all of a sudden, a fairy appeared with a magic wand and waved it over the heads and beds of the sleeping people of Judea and Samaria, and they woke up, and lo and behold, when they went to bed, they were Jordanians. They dreamed they were in a magical cocoon, and they came out as Palestinians. What a miracle. How did that happen? The fact of the matter is that from May of 1948 until June of 1967, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, the Gaza Strip, the Golan Heights, were all firmly in the hands of Arab Muslim rulers. Jerusalem, the West Bank, Gaza, were all in the hands of Arab Muslims. If they wanted a second 
Palestinian states in addition to the one that they themselves already said existed in Jordan. Why did they not simply create one when they had nearly 20 years to do so? Nobody would have stopped them. Abdul Nasser, Gamur Abdul Nasser of Egypt kept the Gazans in subhuman poverty. What happened to Palestinian nationalists if there was such a thing on the Jordanians? They wouldn't have lasted very long. Look at Black September. Tens of thousands of these people driven into refugee camps from Jordan. And now the world blames Israel for something that happened in Jordan? Not that I blame King Hussein. He knew what Arafat was, and he was right to protect himself and his country from that man. But they didn't come from Israel. The myth of the Palestinian refugee. They're not Palestinians. The Jordanians. And most of them came from Jordan, not the West Bank. Israel was forced, forced to conquer the West Bank in 1967. They didn't want that war. They didn't want the war in 1948. They agreed to the UN partition. Look at the facts. It is audio documented recordings in Arabic of the United Arab Command telling the Arab population of Israel to leave, to flee, because the United Arab Command and its armies were going to push the Jews into the sea. Then they would return once the Jews were pushed out. Only they did not bank on losing the war because they had the numbers and they had the arms, much of it provided by the British. The Jews were simply largely refugees or kibbutz farmers or Holocaust survivors. No one thought they would have won, but they did. And they won without much international support from anybody, including America. It didn't exist at that time, but they won anyway. Now, all of a sudden, the aggressor becomes the victim. You drove us out. No, you left. Initially, the Israeli government told them not to leave, beseeched them to stay and make peace. But we're told the lie over and over and over. Open revisionism. When you see a revisionist, somebody who rewrites history, like Philip Church, or Gary Burge, or Steven Sizer, or Colin Chapman, there's only two viable possibilities. Either they are academic frauds, pseudo-scholars, or they are religious liars. I'm not judging them or their motives. Whether they are academic frauds or religious liars or both, I will let someone else decide. I'm only dealing with what they say. It is demonstrable revisionism. They have rewritten history. They are propagating something that is utterly and totally false at odds with the documented records. They had 20 years to make a Palestinian Arab Muslim state if they wanted one, but they didn't. They could have had peace. They rejected it. The Israelis did not want those wars. They were forced to fight in self-defense. But let's go further. The suffering of the Palestinian people, we are told. Despite the hypocrisy and corruption of the United Nations, perhaps there's a bit more honor to be found in the statistics of the World Health Organization. Under the Israelis, following the Six-Day War of 1967, the standard of living of Gaza Strip Arabs in everything from reduced infant mortality to extended longevity to improved employment conditions against the endemic unemployment that had always been there, their standards of living, their life expectancy, the life expectancy of their children, health care, their plight economically, sociologically, and medically improved according to the World Health Organization by 370% under the Israelis compared to what it was under Islamic governments. The West Bank improved by 
what Palestinian suffering? The billions, billions of dollars and euros given to the Palestinian Authority in Gaza and the West Bank before Hamas took over Gaza was not simply misappropriated and misallocated. It was embezzled, swindled by Yasser Arafat and his cohorts. They took money given for economic development, for building an infrastructure, for improving the standard of living, and they stole the money. That is why so many of the people turned to Hamas, the corruption of their own leaders. Yet we're supposed to believe the Israelis are responsible for their poverty and suffering. Then Hamas, of course, expropriated whatever it could for military purposes. We are repeatedly told, land for peace, land for peace, land for peace. Israel gave back the Sinai after 1956 under pressure from the American Eisenhower administration. That same land was used to attack Israel by a Soviet orchestrated attempted invasion in 1967. Now with the Muslim Brotherhood reascending in Egypt, if, if the military loses control in Egypt, there'll be a war again, certainly the threat of it. When Israel was forced to invade southern Lebanon to stop the, not simply the persecution of Christians, but to stop the bombarding of Galilee with Katusha rockets, they returned the land unilaterally. Syria and Iran rushed in with more Katusha rockets in 2006. Thousands and thousands of more fell on the cities of northern Israel, including Haifa, including Arab villages, killing Arabs as well as Jews. That was land for peace. We saw what happened when Israel gave up land for peace. The Bush administration and others pressured Israel to leave Gaza unilaterally. It did. The next day, Katushas fell on the outskirts of Tel Aviv. Hamas openly admits it does not believe in peace, it believes in Hudna, the Islamic doctrine of a temporary ceasefire until you can get the strategic advantage to continue the jihad. When they speak in English, they say peace. When they speak in Arabic, they say Hudna, not Salim. In fact, what they're really saying in the riots and the demonstrations is first the Saturday people, then the Sunday people. First, we will kill the Jews, then we will kill the Christians. Stephen Sizer doesn't tell you that. Hank Hanegraaff doesn't tell you that. Colin Chapman doesn't tell you that. The unspeakable plight of Christians throughout the Arab and Muslim world the first thing that Hamas did was close the Christian bookshops in Gaza. The Palestinian Authority closed the Christian TV station in Bethlehem. They'd made demands even on Catholic sites in Nazareth, and now the Garden Tomb in Jerusalem is under threat from demands to expand, the, expand an Islamic cemetery. Why is it that the Sabia movement and people like Sizer and people like Tony Campola these anti-Israel evangelicals, align themselves with non-evangelicals or with purely political evangelicals like Alex Awad, whose debate with me you can watch on YouTube. As you can see, he doesn't do very well on the basis of scripture or of fact. Why will they align themselves with people who are like that and not pay attention to the voices of pro Zionist Arab Christians. Why won't they listen to Joseph Farah of World Net Daily? Why won't they listen to Walid Shubat? Why won't they listen to Shmuel Edrin Said? Why won't they listen to the Arabs who thank God there's at least one country in the Middle East where Arab Christians are not persecuted for their faith? What happens to the Coptic Christians in Egypt, what happened to the phalangist Christians in Lebanon? What is happening to the Christians in Syria as we speak? What happens to Christians in Saudi Arabia to say nothing of Iran and other Islamic countries in the Middle East? As a Christian, 
as a believer in Jesus, I thank God at least one nation in the Middle East protects the human rights and religious freedom of my Arab Christian brothers. That is Israel. Genocide, three and a half million exterminated by radical Islam in Sudan and Darfur. The world hardly said a word. When Europe turned its back on the plight of the Christian population in Lebanon, it was Israel who took those Maronite Catholic refugees. The plight of evangelicals is even worse in Islamic countries. As a believer in Jesus, I thank God there is at least one country in the Middle East that protects the human rights and religious freedom of my Arab Christian brothers, and that is Israel. Thank God for the Jews, because the Muslim nations kill them. Oh, you will see nominal Christians with some kind of a political agenda. They think perhaps if the West Bank goes back into Islamic control, they want to the court favor before that happens. They're acting out of fear. All of these factors come into play. But the fact of the matter is, find me one nation, Hank Hanegraaff, Find me one nation, Gary Burge. Find me one nation, Stephen Sizer. Find me one nation, Philip Church. Find me one nation in the Middle East where Christians are not persecuted other than Israel. You can't find one because they don't exist. Hypocritically, with the mark of a true coward, you turn your back on the plight of your persecuted brethren and embrace the cause of their persecutors. And you do so in defiance of the plain teaching of both the Old and New Testament. Again, Jesus made it clear the Jews would return to Israel three times, not counting the book of Revelation. Jesus himself, Luke 21, 24, Matthew 23, 39, Zechariah 12, 1 to 10, read it. Your argument is not with me. Your argument is with him. Take it up with him. I simply believe what he said. Quite evidently, you gentlemen do not. Palestine? Palestine? A Palestinian has not existed in over 2,500 years in any ethnic or anthropological or genetic sense of the word. They were Jordanians. They were Gazans. But they were not ethnic Palestinians. This year, 2012, a leader of Hamas admitted that they came from Arabia. Admitted it themselves. They know it. Why don't you, Mr. Burge? Why don't you know it, Mr. Sizer? Or why will you not at least have the courage and integrity to debate me on the basis of historical, anthropological, archeological, and theological fact? Let's understand these issues. Palestine, Palestinian. First, it was Canaanite and it was Israelite, according to the book of Genesis. The indigenous people, with the Israelis. Canaanites are long gone. And Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were there when the Canaanites were there. The archaeological record verifies the Jewish presence being continuous. Whenever it was interrupted, it was restored. Yes, Israel, until 721 BC, was there, but with the Assyrian captivity, it disappeared and it became Samaria. The 585 BC, it was an Israelite presence in Judea. Then came the Babylonians. 70 years later, who comes back? The Israelites, just as God said. It comes under the control of the Persians who gave them a virtual independence. Then it comes under the control eventually of the Seleucid Greeks, but with the Maccabees, as Daniel predicted, they're gone. It's back in the hands of the Jews through the Hasmonean period. Then it comes into the hands of the Romans. But for a two-year period, it's back in the hands of the Jews, then the Romans again, then the Byzantians, 
Then for a brief season, the Arabs, then the Ottomans, the Crusades, Turks again, then the British. None of them have ever lasted. The only nation that has ever continued to return and reestablish itself is the indigenous people, the Israelites, just as the scriptures promised. That is a fact. No Palestinian nation has ever existed except the one that they themselves say is Palestine, Jordan. That is what King Hussein of Jordan, the father of King Abdullah, said. That is what Yasser Arafat said. Once again, they had 20 years to make a second Palestinian Arab Muslim state in addition to the one they said they already had and they saw no need for it. Hypocrisy, revisionism, and absurdity. That's what it is and that's all it is. Come debate me, Mr. Sizer. Debate me, Mr. Church. Debate me, Hank Hanegraaff. Debate me, Gary Burge. I guarantee you will lose. Not because I am more clever or more eloquent, but because the word of God is true, because facts are facts, and you are deluded by what is demonstrably pure, unadulterated propaganda, Islamic propaganda, and utter rubbish. That's what you believe, and that is what you are being used, animated, to try to influence others to believe. The gauntlet is down. Bring your argument. I'll bring the facts. I'll see you at the podium of debate. An adage borrowed by the Nazis stated, if a lie is repeated often enough, people will tell it's the truth. In the art of propaganda and propaganda psychology, just keep repeating something as if it was a fait accompli, an established fact, and a substantial percentage of the general population will come to believe it. The advertising industry understands this, so do government propagandists, so do revisionist historians. Just keep telling the lie often enough, and people will believe it's true. This, however, does not make it true. It has never made it true, and it never can. It's only the historical merits, the veracity of something, which determines its truth or its falsehood. We've been told repeatedly in much of international media, certainly in left-wing academia, and even now among certain evangelical Christians and even left-wing Jews, that Israel is guilty of an occupation, an occupation of Palestine and Palestinian territory. This is the claim, and we hear it repeatedly. We are often told this is substantiated by a violation of UN resolutions, the United Nations, quite a thing. Why do we not see the United Nations speaking about Chinese occupation of Tibetan territory? or Arab occupation of the territory of the Berbers of North Africa, or the Turkish occupation of Kurdish territory. Israel is always somehow singled out, with one exception. There is indeed a Chinese occupation of a national Tibet. There is indeed an Arab occupation of what had historically and traditionally been Berber homelands from Morocco all the way across the north of Africa. Tunisia, Algeria. However, archaeology tells us something concerning the West Bank, concerning Jerusalem, concerning Judea, Samaria, concerning cities today called Nablus, Bethlehem, etc. The archaeological record substantiates 
that the indigenous people are Israelites. The biblical record tells us in the patriarchal narratives in the book of Genesis that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob dwelt in that land as long as the Canaanites. The earliest civilization is Canaanitic and Israelite, or certainly Hebrew, Hebraic peoples. This is verified by archaeology. One can go to any tell with multiple strata of archaeological excavations showing each successive period going back in time. The indigenous people are always what today we would popularly call the Jews. Nobody would ever say, nobody would postulate something as absurd as that the Maoris are occupying New Zealand or that the Apaches occupy Arizona or that Eskimos occupy Greenland. I don't object to Pakia, New Zealanders of European or Anglo-European descent living in New Zealand. But don't try to tell anyone Maoris have no right to be here as the indigenous people that they're an occupying presence. I have no problem with Euro-Americans, with Asian-Americans, with Afro-Americans or Hispanic-Americans living in Arizona. I have no problem whatsoever. But please don't attempt to postulate that Apaches are an occupying presence and have no right to be there. By definition, an indigenous people cannot be called an occupying presence. They were there first. The first historical and anthropological claims to the land is to the indigenous population in every case. However, the United Nations and others expect us to make an exception for the Jews. Unless the indigenous population is Jewish, the law applies. When it's a Jew, we make an exception. They're an occupier. Can a Maori occupy New Zealand? Can an Apache occupy Arizona? Can an Irishman occupy County Tipperary? Well, the answer is obviously no for an obvious reason, and it is just as obvious that a Jew cannot occupy Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Nablus. The claim has been made that the assertions by certain evangelical Christians of a premillennial dispensational perspective and others and by certain Jews of various theological persuasions are based on biblical claims or claims based on the Judeo-Christian scripture to Israel being a Jewish homeland. That is very true. However, I speaking to you as a believer in Jesus, my faith is Judeo-Christian, I do not need to resort to my personal faith to substantiate that conviction, even though it is my conviction. I have archeology. span It is purely Islam that can only base its claims on a religious pretense. Islam divides the entire world into Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Harb, the world of Islam and the world of the sword. Islam traditionally spread by jihad, by military wars. Muhammad personally led 27 military campaigns. The reason the Berbers live under Arab occupation is because of jihad. The reason Islam has extended itself into multiple nations, including Iran, is because of jihad. Islam teaches that once Muslims have conquered a land, it is theirs by the divine right of their God, Allah, that it is given to them by Allah, and it is now part of Dar al-Islam. They can only base their demand on religion, demanding that Jews, Christians, and others acquiesce to the teaching of the Koran. Now, in actual fact, the Hebrew scriptures say that God bequeathed that land, which is his land, to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob forever. In the New Testament, Jesus stated quite clearly, Jerusalem will be trampled down by the feet of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is completed. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 21, verse 24, using the Greek terms pretheron and ethnon, until Gentiles. At the end of Matthew 23, in the 
technical preface to the Olivet Discourse that follows in chapter 24, Jesus made it clear the Jews must be back in Israel and in Jerusalem specifically to herald his return, saying, Baruch haba b'shem Odonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord from the Hebrew Hallel Rabbah liturgy from Psalm 113 to 118. Jesus said that directly. The Jews must be there. They must return. People ignore this. So-called scholars like Gary Burge circumvent it. Others, like Philip Church, simply ignore it and expect others to ignore the plain teaching of Jesus and of the Hebrew Scriptures. But once again, I do not even need to resort to the teaching of Jesus as much as I believe it, or to that of the Hebrew prophets as much as I believe it. The idea that the United Nations of all organizations carries a moral credibility to determine what is an occupation, when that pronouncement is highly selective, when simply because of political considerations they ignore the plight of the Tibetans, when they ignore the plight of Africans being massacred in Darfur by radical Islam, when they ignore the plight of many people suffering under Islam and other regimes. But select Israel and state it as if it's a fact when archaeology and history debunk it as a false claim is absurd. The United Nations, noted for its corruption and inefficiency, oil for food, food for oil, we saw the wasted inefficiency, the misallocation, misappropriation. We saw what happened with the scandals, the payoffs, the kickbacks. In my native New York, I lived directly across the street from the United Nations. I recall looking at the limousines with diplomatic license plates and diplomatic seals of ambassadors to the UN from third world nations with astronomical infant mortality, with unspeakable poverty and injustice, with reserved parking spaces simply for UN diplomats, people from these impoverished countries with elaborate limousines, Rolls Royce, Cadillac, Lincoln Continental, Mercedes Benz, living like kings in Manhattan, living like the salubrious aristocracy they are at the expense of their own people who live in subhuman poverty. And then these same diplomats from the third world will convene inside the UN and pronounce resolutions, biased resolutions against Israel. When you have UN human rights commissions and disarmament commissions composed of nations guilty of the most atrocious human rights violations the modern world has witnessed, when you have countries that have ranged from Libya under Gaddafi to China, when you've had countries ruled by dictators, arms traders, supporters of terror on human rights commissions, passing resolutions, we're supposed to accord the UN some moral credibility. Why not accord moral credibility to organized crime? Why not accord moral credibility to gangsters, to criminals? because that's what most of these regimes passing these resolutions, in fact, are. It's absurd to accord or attribute any moral credibility to an organization that has been as fundamentally corrupt and mismanaged as the United Nations. But for that organization to selectively declare occupation in defiance of the hard archaeological and historical evidence that no one can challenge, while turning its back on the real occupations that take place throughout the world, goes beyond hypocrisy. But for people claiming to be Christians, to subscribe to this hypocrisy, for people like Stephen Sizer in the UK, or Philip Church in New Zealand, or Gary Burge in the USA, to lend credence to obvious absurdity is well beyond the pale. Let's face the facts. An indigenous people cannot be an occupying presence. They were there first. The actual fact of the matter is that there were Jewish communities throughout the West Bank and in Gaza till the 1920s. 
They were destroyed in Islamic pogroms. The so-called Israeli settlements are restorations of the Jewish communities that had been there that Islam obliterated. They are the indigenous people. They reconquered that land, not in an act of aggression, but in self-defense in a war they did not want. The only thing Israel has been guilty of is withstanding the scourge of radical Islam and jihad. These same people in the Western world are going to reap it themselves. In fact, the Hebrew prophet Obadiah in verse 15 says this. Find me a single nation that has allowed Islamic immigration that has not had the plague of riots and terror. From the Bandler riots in Paris going on week after week to the riots in Sydney, Australia, to the Bradford riots in England, to the September 11th attacks in the United States, this is only a hint of what the Israelis have had to face daily, year after year after year. That same curse that the Israelis respond to in self-defense is now a curse that has come to the shores of Europe and America. It is time to wake up. No, I am not against Arabs. Arab Christians are my brethren. But look at the plight of Arab Christians. Look at what happens to Christians in Arab countries. Gary Burge does not talk about this, either does Mr. Church or Stephen Sizer. 3.4 million Christians murdered by Islam in Darfur and Sudan in 14 years. 3.4 million. Upwards of 98%, 98% of the evangelical pastors in Iran have been martyred. While the Saudi Arabian government funds the construction of mosques and Islamic institutions all over the Western world, including America, Australia, Britain, Europe, you cannot build one church in Saudi Arabia. You cannot even bring a New Testament into that country. They cannot show you a single Islamic nation, not one, that will give Jews and Christians the rights Muslims have in Israel or in America or in New Zealand or in Britain or in any Western democracy. It is absurd. It is ridiculous. There are two standards. Come, debate me, Gary Burge. Debate me, Philip Church. Debate me, Stephen Sizer. You agreed to debate me on TV in Great Britain, Mr. Sizer, and then you back down. Come, debate me. You can bring your propaganda. I will bring irrefutable facts, certainly from scripture, but also from archeology span and from history. Things I challenge you to challenge. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings of Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcasts and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon, and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, 
Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be shadows of the beast. Shadows of the beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo, Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available in the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.